we all kind of need each other and let's work together rather than expecting one of your practitioners to bear the load or expecting nutrition's gonna solve everything. So we try and take the best from everything, right? Like functional, uh, naturopathic, Eastern, Western, mm -hmm. all of it, right? We try and mush it all together and go, this is all the good stuff. Let's try and do this, right? That so we <laughs> that we know of, and there's probably stuff we don't know. So we keep an open mind for sure. <laughs> I'd like to welcome to the Vegan Wellness World Summit, James and Dahlia Marin. They're based in Newport Beach, California, and they're the co-founders of Married to Health, which is an integrative dietetic practice focused on nutrition therapy. So welcome, James and Dahlia. Hi, thank, thank you for having you. us. Yes, yes, I'm, we're integrative registered dietitian. I'm also an environmental nutritionist. And, and yeah, we founded a practice because we recognized we wanted to practice as registered dietitians a little bit differently. And so mm -hmm. we like to integrate both worlds in our practice. Our, we are five dietitians in total. And all of us do like to practice in that way where we're integrating the best of plant-based nutrition with, you know, Western medicine when it's indicated with Eastern modalities and really just help our patients try to tolerate, eat, include more plants into their life and really get to the bottom of what ails them specifically with their gut. So that's where my passion lies. I specialize in gut health, specifically in those who have IBS, irritable bowel syndrome and SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So that is what I really, really love focusing on. I love helping people figure out the root cause of what ails them every single day. And we know food is very personal. You eat three, four, five times a day. And if that is including pain, gas, bloating every single time, we want to figure out why. So that way you feel ethically great, or you feel environmentally great, or you feel mentally and physically great with what you're eating and you're digesting it really well. And you're absorbing all the nutrition from it. And in this time of innovation technology, we're, we're blessed and we've, and that's why this is another aspect of us practicing differently is, is we can see patients from all over the world. So we have patients in Australia, we see patients in the UK and Canada, and we're based in Orange County, California. So we're utilizing that telemedicine aspect, that telehealth aspect aspect. So we have quite a, a large patient base. So it's really cool to connect with all these people and even connect with you mm -hmm. here now. So it's great. Yeah. We're so excited to connect with you both. And it's also fun because you happen to be a married couple and a pair of yep. registered dietitians who actually founded the first fully vegan uh, nutrition program for uh, SIBO and IBS. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and what makes your program different? Yes. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, uh, depending on what everyone knows about SIBO and IBS, I mean, we're hearing that more and more, unfortunately, and, and fortunately, right, because we want to spread this awareness and education. But, you know, typically, you know, in a SIBO IBS protocol or program that you're in, you're encouraged to eat more animal products, right? More mm -hmm. animal products don't contain fiber. They don't contain these FODMAPs, which we'll get into what, what that acronym stands for. Um, but, you know, they don't contain these fermentable uh, products within them. So it's like, okay, great. Eat more chicken, eat more fish, eat more beef and pork. And, you know, that way it helps lower this bloat. It's going to help with your SIBO and IBS, but that's really not the whole story. So we really wanted to fill in these gaps and really kind of frame this bigger picture of true, really deep health. And especially for those that are vegan, like Dahlia mentioned for ethics or environment or health, you know, you can also overcome your SIBO and IBS without having to sacrifice things that you love in terms of your ethics. So. Or even go on an overly restrictive diet. So um, yeah. James mentioned FODMAPs and that really is standard of practice with going on a low FODMAP diet. And that stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Mouthful, right? They're basically fermentable carbohydrates and starches. Um, and so that excludes several different types of plant foods. So when you are on a low FODMAP diet, which should only be up to about eight weeks, really the researchers, Monash University, who created a low FODMAP diet, it wasn't created to be a long-term solution. So right. it's basically for symptom relief. So you're not fermenting these foods, onions and garlic and apples and asparagus and large amounts of broccoli. These are all very nutrient dense foods. And yes, they are more fermentable because generally speaking, that fermentation process is good for our gut. 
But in cases of certain types of IBS, SIBO being one of them, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you're fermenting in the wrong area. And so you're having this over fermentation. We're supposed to be fermenting in the last part of our intestines, in our colon, in our large intestine. And that is a very microbe rich area. And a majority of our hundred trillion microbes that live within our gut microbiome, they live in our colon. Sometimes for different situations, for different reasons, like dysmotility, slow movement in the gut, dysbiosis, right? We're hearing a lot of people talk about dysbiosis or imbalance of who's living inside of your gut, your gut bugs. Maybe you have an overabundance of bacteria or yeast or, you know, fungus or um, archaea and not only are they imbalanced, but they creep up, they move upward into the small intestine. And the small intestine is where we're doing a majority of our digestion and absorption. So all these gut bugs are saying, Ooh, party, all this food. I didn't get to have this part of the food before. And it starts over fermenting. And so those with SIBO, which is a type of IBS, or it could be, um, emo, which is an intestinal methanogenic overgrowth, or it could be CIFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, right? All these different organisms can overgrow. They're going to feel really gassy and bloated when they eat these more fermentable foods. So sounds sensible to say, well, then eliminate them for a while and see how you feel. People will feel better generally, not everybody, um, but generally people will feel better low FODMAP. So we do utilize it sometimes in our practice, or we do incorporate it as well into um, our program that's getting ready for relaunch. But then they hit a wall where they're like, well, I'm at my eight week point, but I can't tolerate them yet. I've tried, I've tried Mm -hmm. to start reintroducing things right around that six to eight week elimination. It's still a no go. So then what do they do at that point? They either resolve to say, I'm just going to keep doing this, even though it's going to put me at risk for nutrient deficiencies, even though it's affecting my relationship with food, which it does, Mm -hmm. right? You get into this very restrictive mindset and this very resentful mindset as far as food goes of, I wish I could eat it because they can eat it. And um, so it kind of, you know, puts people, pins people back against a wall where they're like, I haven't figured out the why behind my symptoms and I'm just continuing to restrict and feel very restrictive in my mindset. So that's really where we come in and we're like, okay, you know, oftentimes they might have worked with another dietitian. They might've gotten this advice from their gastroenterologist to go low FODMAP. And they come to us saying, I've tried it. It helped, but I can't move past it. I'm stuck there. And so we'll help our patients work with their care team to understand one, what is the root of your symptoms? Why are you feeling this way? Are you having pelvic floor dysfunction? Are you having blood sugar imbalances? Are you having um, hormonal changes that might be in impacting this and playing into this. Let's work with your care team and ask your physicians to check these different things. Um, how's your gallbladder functioning? What's going on in your liver? So we really like educating patients on figuring out why not just doing things that help alleviate symptoms and then really getting to the root of that, supporting that and restoring their relationship with food. I'm finding that that is such a big part of all of this. Yes. All, all that to summarize and say that we, we've we really dedicated ourselves to be another path for you, right? Mm-hmm. So like Dolly mentioned, when you're up against that wall, the path is stay vegan or 100% plant-based and really restrict mm-hmm. and feel anxious and nervous about food for the rest of my life. Or I'm going to feel, we have so many patients, I feel guilty. I started eating eggs and I started mm-hmm. eating chicken and fish and I feel horrible and I hate this. Or kind of a, I guess the third option is like, I'm on antibiotics every other like three months and I'm just taking antibiotics because that's the only thing that makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've dedicated ourselves to be another path, right. Of Mm -hmm. saying like, okay, you have a a fourth option now, right. Let's, let's go down that path. Yeah. Wow. What important work. And I think we all know somebody who has something like that or some kind of digestive issue or uh, chronic disease where they think that they're doing the right thing by listening to the doctors. And there are people that are already vegan or plant-based and then they get recommended to reintroduce animal products into the diet. And, you know, they're trying to treat this condition and they think that they're taking the right advice by doing that. So what, how does this happen? Where's the disconnect between the medical doctors or the gastroenterologist or whoever's directing them to reintroduce the animal products? And what does it actually do? How can they still maintain their vegan diet and treat their symptoms or treat yeah. the root 
I should say? That's a great question. And I honestly, I feel for medical professionals, right? I feel for physicians and physicians assistants and PAs. I think people are outraged that they don't know more about nutrition, but I don't understand why you wouldn't go to a mechanic and get mad at them for not understanding the work of an electrician. Doctors are doctors. They are medical doctors. They are trained in medicine and they are trained in procedures and they are fantastic at it. We go to them when we need those things. I'm not understanding why as a society we've collectively decided they also have to be dietitians. I think the one area that may be lacking is really using that interdisciplinary care and saying, okay, something's going on with your gut. I think we do need more gastroenterologists to recognize like Dr. Desmond does, you know, Dr. Will Bolsowitz, Dr. Vanessa Mendez. We do have these amazing gastroenterologists who recognize diet does matter, but there's still 40 plus percent of gastroenterologists today who are telling their patients diet has nothing to do with your symptoms, your GI symptoms. Which is crazy. Which that's crazy when you think about that it. We know that that's not the case. And so it's, One, understanding, yes, actually it does. Um, It's quite literally the substrate that's going through your intestines every day. And two, recognizing your doctor's not going to know all about diet and you shouldn't expect them to. Um, If you are needing help with that and maybe they got you started, they suggested something and it's not working for you, then follow up with an expert. You know, registered dietitians are the experts in nutrition. And we're noticing, you know, more of a trend of doctors taking interest in nutrition, which is fantastic. Um, But there's a lot of nuance in it. It's not just understanding what medical nutrition therapy is appropriate for somebody to say, maybe let's try a low histamine way of eating for a little bit or low oxalate, or let's, let's tweak this and that. Mm -hmm. It's also understanding the weight of your words and the impact that that will have on somebody's relationship with food. So as registered dietitians, we also are understanding when it's appropriate to recommend an elimination diet. Perhaps if we pick up on signals that there's eating disorder there. There's disordered eating. There's history of eating disorder. This might not be an appropriate patient to put on a full elimination diet. If it's someone coming to you crying saying, I've been on an elimination diet, different elimination diets for three years. And now I only eat five things. You're not going to say, Oh, well, let's try this other elimination diet. So it's really understanding the power of not only what nutrition can do, but how to appropriately use it with, um, understanding somebody's mental space with their food and their relationship, their emotional and mental relationship with food. And so Mm -hmm. I think once we really collaborate with one another, because I always tell my patients, I recommend to them, you should have still a physician. I think especially nowadays where things have become so polarized where it's like, Oh, well, I gave up on Western medicine and now I only work with my naturopath and my holistic practitioners. And I get that people have become disenchanted with Western medicine for the most part. And so then they kind of doctor themselves or they're going to alternative practitioners, which I completely respect all practitioners. And I think it should be collaborative because Certain things I can't do. Certain things physicians are not well-trained in. Certain things naturopaths are not well-trained in. But I think we can all very much collaborate with one another and really help patients understand that we all kind of need each other and let's work together rather than expecting one of your practitioners to bear the load or expecting nutrition is going to solve everything um, or medicine is going to solve everything or this supplement or herb is going to solve everything. Sometimes it's a combination. It's a collaborative effort between all of those disciplines, mm-hmm. physical therapists, others as well. And I want to, if I can add the other side of that coin, like two aspects is really the, the systems we're in. And, and first and foremost, that's why our practice, we try and take the best from everything, right? Like functional, uh, naturopathic, Eastern, Western, mm-hmm. all of it, right? We try and mush it all together and go, this is all the good stuff. Let's try and do this, right? That so we <laughs> that we know of, and there's probably stuff we don't know. So <laughs> we keep an open mind for sure. Mm-hmm. But the other side of that coin is we also have to realize, especially for those in the United States and this Western, right? Western culture is that our systems are not very integrative, right? Our, our scientific methods and even the, the scientific method is that of reductionism, right? A reductionist approach, meaning we're going to compartmentalize just like we compartmentalize the body, right? Oh, you have upper respiratory infection that has nothing to do with the gut. And now we're finding out, yes, they're very much connected, right? Diabetes. Oh, it's just diabetes. It's just your pancreas. 
well, the pancreas is in our body connected to all the organ systems. And then now we're going, oh, that's the endocrine system, which is connected to your ovaries and your pituitary. You know, so it's like we, we compartmentalize and I get it because it's very overwhelming. The human body, it's like, whoa, it's a lot. So Amazing. You, you need sometimes to compartmentalize and specialize. However, it, it takes... a a certain practitioner and it takes time to understand this integrative aspect of of just like what Dahlia said, maybe you are specialized in the heart or you're specialized in nutrition or you're specialized in the pancreas, but you have to have that integrative mindset to go, okay, it's time to collaborate Mm -hmm. because it's much bigger than just this one little compartment, right? So we have to understand just like doctors aren't trained in nutrition, our entire system of science is that of this reductionism where now I think we're at a tipping point where, where we're evolving to move towards a more holistic, right? Which is a scary word for some, Ooh, that's scary. Holistic. That sounds hippy dippy and not, not scientific, but it's actually extremely scientific, right? Another aspect of that just really quickly is, is the insurance model, right? Is the actual payment structures surrounding these systems, right? Where, in 10 minutes, can you really get to the depth of a patient, right? When most doctors and health professionals only have 10 minutes to actually see a patient? It, it, no, the, the short answer is no, you can't, right? So as we're at this tipping point, as, as we're, even as we speak, or whether you're learning it from this podcast or another one or wherever you're learning it, it's getting out there into this ether and more people are realizing, wow, a lot of things need to be shifted. Not so much that they're wrong. It's just that we need to evolve. We need to shift. We're at this tipping point. Let's kind of fully tip it over and change the way we do things so that we can all like thrive here. Right. So those are two other sides to that that point but yeah just and when we when we think of holistic we think of holistic with a w just right the whole person <laughs> and integrating that whole picture right beautiful points and you know talking about being able to maintain your veganism even if you're getting medical advice to do otherwise it sounds like the response here is the root cause right is that you can't rely on just one person to know everything, especially a doctor to be your nutritionist or a gastroenterologist to be your physician. You need a whole team of people in some cases to be able to diagnose the things that they're specialized in. And it kind of reminds me of, so it's almost like a lot of Americans, especially were taught that your doctor means a primary care physician, but a primary care physician, it means primary care. So what about secondary care, tertiary care, your preventative care, like all the types of care. It's almost like they're the first responders, right? They're there. And they, like you said, they're amazing at doing medicine. They're amazing at saving people in emergency situations. And when they do have severe symptoms and lessening the symptoms, but then what about treating the root cause? Your mm-hmm. average doctor, your average primary care doctor may not have the time to, you know, specialize in everything to be able to treat every single problem. So like you said, we kind of need to expand the network and also be open-minded enough as the patient to ask for Mm. second opinions or third opinion, look up information like, yeah, you shouldn't be basing all of your decisions off of Wikipedia and Google searches, Mm -hmm. but it can be something that you can, you know, broaden your, your knowledge a little bit and bring questions to your provider. And then also looking for other providers that can be part of the Uh, the diagnosing process, right? Totally. I think, yeah, a lot of the focus is on, and and then that's on both of us as patients and as providers, people come to us when something's wrong. It's an an infrequent thing that we're saying, oh, okay, you know, I'm just going in for my yearly checkup. Um, So it's usually I'm going because something has happened. And again, when what James was saying, there's little time to speak about that and prevention and optimization. And that's where, you know, establishing a relationship with the dietitian, one who practices in that way can be really great where we're saying, okay, yes, let's address this. And then let's prevent future issues as well. And let's optimize. So that way you're not finding yourself back in this cycle and back in this loop again. And I think it speaks to underlying natural themes we see in many areas of, of community, right? This is a, a community. You're, you're forming a health community, um, whether that's a health community for acute issues, like, oh my gosh, I'm so bloated and it hurts. 
okay, you have an acute community, but you want to also form this preventative community, this optimizing community. And we see these themes that it continues in our food, the idea of in a community, you have diversity. We, the, the scientific literature is pointing you towards diversity, right? In your diet. So even if you're vegan, you're eating plants, there are tons of diversity, but I know we all know that vegan who just eats tofu, rice, and broccoli every day or whatever, you know, or they go to the same restaurants, you know, every week. It's like, get that diversity, especially when you're vegan, because you need all those nutrients in the plants. Animals aren't there to consolidate all that for you. So even more so, right? It speaks to that in nature. In order for those plants to be healthy, we need that soil diversity, which comes from the ecological diversity, right? So in every single layer, including our health, we are seeing communities of diverse populations, communities of diverse populations. That's what we need. And, and all these layers. So it, it continues in your healthcare as well. And I think it's becoming really accessible, more accessible, right? In these last several years, being plant-based and maintaining plant-based nutrition and a plant-based lifestyle is more than just, I watched a documentary and I got all my facts from there, or I went to a conference and I saw these people who might not have been accessible, right? In the past, we were kind of just a ragtag bunch saying like, yeah, we work in universities or hospitals or other places where maybe you don't have access to us. More and more practitioners like us are saying, we want to become accessible to people, right? We're opening up our own practices. We offer virtual care. We're seeing other plant-based physicians mm -hmm. who are doing the same. And it's wonderful to say, oh yeah, you are seeing Dr. So-and-so. Yes, of course, absolutely. And you trust their recommendations. And we're really creating this vegan primary and secondary and tertiary care network now, which we think is so wonderful. Yeah. And I love what you mentioned, James, about diversity in the diet, you know, having the colorful plate and uh, mm -hmm. you guys focus on whole food plant-based and yeah, vegans are a plant-based diet, but they're just one form of plant-based diet. There's <laughs> vegans that could eat everything from cans and packaged foods, processed foods. And right. I think it's important to note here because it can get confusing looking at other studies and other examples of people that are healthy that are not vegan, because you know what, a lot of them are doing diversity of foods better than some vegans we know are. So that can muddle things up. Like, yeah, they're eating, uh, they're eating some meat and eggs here and there, but they're also eating a ton of plant-based foods. So you might look at that and think like, oh, well, they're, that's better than a vegan diet, but it could be what you're talking about with the diversity and making sure we actually know the nutrient profiles of the food and we're supplementing well, and we're looking at the whole package. It can involve things even beyond nutrition, right? Like your sleep and your exercise mm -hmm. and your stress levels oh and my gosh. Like the whole person, it's a whole circle, whole spectrum that we have to look at. Yeah. And that speaks to, I mean, everyone's on a different climb, right? We're all, we're all climbing this health mountain and we're all in different areas. And that's where we really do our best. And it's something we're very conscious about is, is this judgment, right? Mentality of like, oh my gosh, they're eating that or, or, oh, and then you see this fragmentation in the plant-based community and vegan communities of like, oh, the junk food vegans and oh, the whole food plant-based people and all these. And it's like, guys, we're, we're all trying to do the same thing at the end of the day. And really everybody, I think on this planet for the most part is like, you're trying to be healthy. You're trying to provide, you're trying to live a happy, healthy life with your family. And we, we all essentially want the same thing. So, you know, it's like, it's, it's coming from this non-judgmental place. It's really just trying to let the science speak. It's really coming from a healthy place of then interpreting the science for our patients and our community and those that decide to follow us and just educate with love, right? We're not here to be like, oh, Beyond Burgers are gross and blah, and then do a post on like, or a blog on Beyond Burgers are terrible. It's, it just comes from such a negative judgmental place where it's like, maybe you enjoy a Beyond Burger and that's like 0.001% of your diet. And I just happen to see you eating it. Who am I, who am I to judge that? Right. Um, and we, that's the perspective we try to bring is like, yeah, this is an option. Sure. <laughs> and we try to educate on like, what are you eating? What is in that Beyond Burger? And why might not it be the best choice to have every single day? What are alternatives and what might be a better option since mm -hmm that might raise your cholesterol, that might cause a little bit of insulin resistance that might cause or exacerbate hypertension. You know, what are some other options that you do have? Um, and then, you know, especially if somebody is dealing with SIBO IBS, we want to help them come up with a path of 
well, then what can I eat? If a lot of these elimination diets mm -hmm. are focused on what you can't eat and what you should avoid, we always like to focus on, well, let's focus on what you can and should be eating and the diversity that you do want to be including. So that way we can maintain that healthy relationship with food and it's sustainable. And it's something that helps you alleviate your issues, not just make new issues <laughs> or, you know, leave you with uh, unanswered questions with what you currently have going on. And this is something we share with our entire team of a, a good, better, best system here and mentality, right? So even are there are the three dietitians on our team who specialize one is more like metabolically focused for like healthy body composition. Diabetes, one is also very much, yeah, diabetes. One is also gut health, kind of like us. And with eating disorder focus. Yeah. So he has an eating disorder focus. Another one more is family, you know, mindful, intuitive eating. And she's great. She has a little baby and wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so even though they have different focuses, we're on the same page with our core values. And we do em implore this good, better, best, right? Depending where you are, that's good. And then maybe we can go to better and here's best, but you know, it's not like everyone's going to do ideal, right? It's not, everyone's going to do that best scenario. So there's good and there's better. And then maybe one day you get to best if that works for you. So we're very fluid with that. And I think it's, it's very important to be. Yeah. Yeah. I love that idea. Good, better, best. It takes some of the pressure off, right? Like maybe I'm not going to be the best today, but I'll at least choose the good decision, you know, <laughs> right. Take that first step. And through your practice, you also offer some things that you wouldn't necessarily see in a primary care practice, like uh, helping people set up their kitchen, clean up their kitchen and their fridge, yeah. taking people down the aisles of the grocery store. And when you take a step back, you think like, yeah, these are kind of premium uh, different services I haven't seen before. When you take a step back and really think about it, it's like, well, why, why don't we get taught these things, especially <laughs> when you go to your average grocery store and there's literally thousands of items on the shelves and it's a little bit easier to go in the produce section, right? Cause a banana is a banana. Well, most of the time, Right. <laughs> but how do we decode all of these things that are in our environment? And mm -hmm. I think that ties to, you mentioned James, that you do environmental nutrition. Is that part of what that is? Or can you explain what environmental nutrition is? Yeah. And I think, and, and we kind of all do, but I've, I've really, you know, I'm, I'm in love with permaculture and regenerative agriculture. I try to stay up to date on, on everything, you know, with soil science as much as possible, just because the connection is there. Right. And a recent study in 2019 connected, we are getting, and we've seeded most of our gut microbiota with the soil microbiota, right? We, we are very much connected to the soil microbiota. It mirrors our gut microbiota. And we're, we're essentially inside out farms in a way, when you think about it, like, you know, we are the soil and that whole soil ecosystem is inside of us. And instead of it being on the outside, we are putting inputs or whatever you want to call it, fertilizers and things like that into our mouths. And then our microbes break that down, create new byproducts and then feed the rest of our body. Right. So we're, we're inside out plants essentially and farms. So, you know, with that aspect, we, we look at what's in the soil, what's in your water. You know, we, we look at even more, um, more kind of just closer uh, environments like your room, your car, your home, your air quality, air quality in the home, right? So these are factors you, you can't deny. They're, they're becoming more and more undeniable. And even to that point of great, you're vegan, you're eating at these new vegan fast food restaurants. We're finding that PFAS, right? Perfluorinated chemicals are in all this fast food wrapping and packaging. And so great, you're, you're vegan, uh, but you're still being exposed to the same environmental toxins that people eating at other, you know, animal-based fast food chains are being exposed to. So are we, are we trying to be more like this fast food America? Or are we trying to do something different here? And it's, it's just kind of giving this information, creating this consciousness, and then you decide what to do with it. Right. Um, and we really try to do it in a way that's not overwhelming I know like in this interview, we're talking and touching on a lot of things and no way do we touch on this much in like an initial visit. It's really tailored to our patients of like, okay, what's going on? And we take it step by step. But, um, but these are all the things we're thinking about. These, this is that holistic with a W, right? And that includes mm -hmm. this environmental nutrition where your environment matters. Your environment 
is essentially is nutrition, right? You're taking the outside world and putting it inside mm-hmm. your body. We call that food. Yes. Yeah. And in our program that is relaunching that SIBO IVS program that is relaunching next year, which we're excited about, we are touching on all of these different things. So these are all things that we're educating on. These are all these tangible mm-hmm. things that people will learn about and take away and really understand how to implement to their lives. Just again, to not only alleviate their current gut issues, but to go on and thrive and make Mm -hmm. it sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. And Dahlia, you were talking about the FODMAPs earlier. So FODMAPs and also things like gluten and salt, and there's all these things that we've heard, oh, that's bad. You know, these judgments, just these mass judgments (laughs) of it's a good food or it's a bad food, but Mm -hmm. you hear these things that are commonly used on an elimination diet to essentially diagnose if there's something that someone's eating that's causing these symptoms and they get a bad rep, right? (laughs) So can you talk a little bit to that? And when do, when do people need to go on an elimination diet or are Mm -hmm. things like FODMAPs and gluten bad? I kind of asking this rhetorically now, but how, how do you know which foods are quote unquote good or bad and when to eliminate or to introduce things into your diet? That's a really great question. And I think that that has been so ingrained in us to think of that, like this food's good, this food's bad. One thing that I like to really work with my patients on is to kind of just try to see food very objectively. So that way it doesn't affect the relationship with food, but think of what is inflammatory and what is anti-inflammatory. What inflames me might not necessarily inflame you. I have my own gut microbiome and my gut microbiota might be made up of different organisms or different proportions of organisms than yours. So perhaps for whatever reason, perhaps I have SIBO IBS and I don't tolerate gluten. Gluten contains a compound called fructans. So they're chains of fructose molecules and these are more fermentable. So for some people, they might not have celiac disease, right? We know celiac is an autoimmune disease um, and that affects the lining of the intestines that affects the villi of the intestines. So we have autoimmune attack when we consume gluten with celiac disease, that person, yes, gluten is going to be very inflammatory for them. It's going to cause this cascade of autoimmune response. That person should avoid gluten. Um, for somebody with SIBO IBS, they might not tolerate wheat because it is higher in fructans. They might slowly start to tolerate things like sourdough over time where it's fermented. So some of those fructans have been broken down a little bit more over time as they heal their gut. And perhaps they're not experiencing those symptoms that are IBS. Perhaps they are reintroducing gluten and they're tolerating it. And that's always the goal. So you want to think of what foods are inflammatory for me right? And that's where you get into the whole concept as well of, you know, oh, lectins are bad, right? We had a whole campaign from a physician who was trying to say that lectins are bad and lectins are a compound that are found in a lot of different legumes. They're found in grains. They're found in a lot of vegetables that have small seeds in them. It's actually a protein. They are, they are a type Mm -hmm. of protein. They're a type of an, an amino acid. And so these have never one been scientifically proven to generate inflammation. They've actually been shown to be anti-inflammatory. They're high in antioxidants. They Mm -hmm. are types of proteins with antioxidants in them. And so you want to understand, okay, if I'm not tolerating legumes and we can't say that it's lectins that are generating this inflammation, what is it? What is it about legumes? You know, is it the fact that they are a little bit more fermentable and why isn't my gut tolerating these more fermentable foods? So, um, especially for somebody on a plant-based diet. I think a lot of the times people are really quick to implicate the plants and the fact that they are a little bit more complex to digest shows that one, usually things that are harder to do reap more benefits, right? So your body needs to go through a deeper process to break down that fiber, to ferment that fiber, to really respond to that type of fiber or that type of starch or that type of um, Mm -hmm. sugar that's found in the fruit. You really want to understand why is my body responding this way? Why am I having an inflammatory response to whatever it is? Right. And certain things we can kind of just across the board, very objectively, very scientifically say, 
that, yes, has been shown to generate a little bit more inflammation, inflammation, right? It's sugars, refined sugars. And I'm not talking about sugar found in fruit. I'm not talking about fructose. I'm talking about refined, um, highly processed sugars, refined, highly processed grains, alcohol. Um, we are talking also about high amounts of saturated fats that are mm-hmm. found in animal proteins, but can also come from large amounts of coconut or palm oil products in the diet. These have been scientifically shown to generate inflammation for the general population. Mm -hmm. Let's start there with those low hanging fruits before we're jumping to implicate and say, oh, it's the tomatoes, (laughs) right? It's every time I'm eating tomatoes. Um, And certainly there are instances where perhaps the microbiome has been so offset and somebody is in such deep dysbiosis imbalance where maybe they've lost entire populations of species or a large portion of a species uh, like oxalobacter, right? Maybe they're not breaking down the oxalates that are found in some of these foods. So certainly maybe when they don't have that entire species in their gut and they're eating oxalate rich foods, spinach, they're eating certain types of legumes and certain types of grains, Maybe they are reacting to those, Mm -hmm. but you want to figure out why, what happened in your gut story that caused that same with histamines, right? Maybe patients are saying every time I eat these foods, I'm eating soy and I'm so bloated. I'm eating different nuts and seeds. I'm eating certain fermented vegetables and fruits and I'm so bloated. I'm so uncomfortable. I'm itchy. I feel inflamed. Okay. What has gone on? What's going on in your gut? Why aren't you tolerating histamines? Mm -hmm. What has caused that? breakdown in first the protective mucus layer, and then the lining of the intestines to really be exposing more of these, um, these histamine producing cells in the body. Yeah. And to, to kind of continue that, this is where you put on the environmental nutritionist hat and, and you go, look, what's happening is inside of our body, we're, there's a loss of diversity, right? So for anyone who cares about the rainforest or the coral reefs and we're like, oh my gosh, we're losing diversity or there's damage being done. It honestly, quite frankly, starts with you. It starts with inside of your body. We are losing our own microbial diversity within us as a result of the outside. So just as there's people actively trying to do regenerative farming and, and, you know, Dahlia and I, and what we're doing for the most part, for the last 80 years, we've been actively, actively doing the opposite, right? We've been moving more to an industrialized monoculture farming, right? So we've been actively going, how do we produce more food? How do we make it more packageable? How do we make it more transportable? How do we make it last longer? So we've been actively shaping food, not for the health and biodiversity and benefit of our bodies, we've been doing it for the benefit of monetary gain, right? Quite frankly. And so now we're looking at that and going, oops, ooh, we kind of, <laughs> we kind of been growing food, you know, the wrong way. And, and mind you, there's still a lot of people who haven't even realized this, right? Where, oh, maybe these monocrops aren't really conducive to actual human health, right? They're conducive to making money, Um, They're conducive to then making money for pesticides and herbicides and rodenticides. Um, They they transport really well. They're easy to, to pick and throw in a box, but are they actually healthy? So it's not so much wheat is bad or, or these legumes are bad or things like that, but maybe what we're spraying on them, maybe how we are treating them because to go a little deeper, these plants are living genetic data. And when we are shaping that genetic data down a bad path, we're going to get bad genetic results, right? So we're going to get, as we're shaping the food to be like, last longer, uh, withstand the cold here, we're going to genetically modify that and blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. It's more difficult to digest. (laughs) It's more difficult to digest. Maybe it needs more chemical pesticides. And then that has pesticide residue that is going to disrupt your own gut, right? It's, it's less uh, medicinal or the whole reason why we have plants is for us to be nurtured and nourished and have medicinal properties. These foods are less medicinal when we're picking them early. And we are, I mean, this is, this is overall genetic modification. However, this is called selective breeding. So that's a whole nother rabbit hole to go down, but, but, you know, it really goes back to kind of having this consciousness, consciousness of going, Whoa, where am I getting my food? Does this big corporation growing food in China and South America, and then shipping it here to the United States, does it really have my health in mind? 
And chances are no. And so, you know, if you're going like, I ate that tomato and it made me feel horrible. Was that a tomato that was picked in Mexico like three months ago and was on a, a shipping or a what, like a, a truck shipped and then it was on the grocery shelf for a while and it was, and it's probably not good to begin with. And then you're swearing off all tomatoes versus you go to your farmer's market and you're picking an heirloom tomato that was literally picked that morning and you're eating it and it tastes completely different, has a completely different effect on your body. That matters, right? So all of that context is needed for your healing and for you to reach your goals. And that is important for sure. Right. It's so fascinating thinking of how the food is grown in the first place and how it comes to us and the processes of packaging it, of preserving it and how that affects the the nutrient profile and how we're able to digest it ultimately. And right. Dahlia, I think you were kind of alluding to as well, the way that food is prepared, how we cook it, how we combine it. And there might be a nod here to some of the Eastern practices you were talking about, like Ayurveda, for instance, and things like eating seasonally or um, like the temperatures of food. So uh, can you speak a little bit to that, like food preparation? And also what have we learned from the ancient Eastern practices of food to increase our ability to digest and get the most out of it? Yeah, I love that question. And I love what you mentioned about eating seasonally. We're very passionate about that. And we often do recommend to our patients, try hitting up your local farmer's market or even just know what's in season. So if you are shopping at a local grocery store, you're purchasing foods that are hyper local and they are more nutrient dense. Perhaps we're buying frozen because we know that when things are frozen, they're usually flash frozen on site or very close by. A lot of the nutrients were retained. And then if we are having gut issues like SIBO, IBS, we're saying, how can we make this food more digestible? So we know breaking down the fiber is in essence, kind of pre-digesting the food, if you will. It's, it's mm -hmm. making it just a little bit more digestible. It's removing some of that burden, some of that work from your body that is trying to heal. So instead perhaps uh, of saying, I'm going to eat these huge salads all the time, which might be a little bit more difficult to digest for some people. If you find that that's really causing a lot of discomfort for you, break down the fiber in advance. Perhaps you're using frozen, pre-frozen, because we know when things freeze, the ice crystals perforate the cellulose fiber and it breaks it down. So it's just a little bit easier to digest. Um, perhaps then you're taking that frozen and you are then cooking it. We know cooking also breaks down the fiber. Maybe then you're cooking it and making it into a soup that you're going to blend. So that third layer of blending the food, maybe that's also making it a little bit easier to digest. And so we're encouraging people to play around with those different concepts and play around with those different things and see what stage of breakdown do you tolerate that food best in? And yeah, what most nutrient dense seasonal food are you tolerating the very best and what can we try? And that's why with what we do with patients, it's, Yes, it might be temporary elimination, but what we've really developed is a reverse elimination. So mm -hmm. we say, sure, let's maybe be in a couple weeks of elimination, three to four weeks. Then from there, we're going group by group, phase by phase. We're saying, okay, let's try to add back in some simple grains. Let's try to add back in legumes. Let's try to add back in um, more fat, nuts and seeds. Let's add back in whole grains. Let's add back in fermented foods. See how you do with those. Let's ba add back in a ton of raw and see how you do with that. So it's really kind of layer by layer saying, what are you tolerating? Where did you hit a snag? And let's understand why. <laughs> Yeah. It's funny to think about like most people are very comfortable with elimination. They get it. And the focus is on elimination. Great. I can get to zero. I'm down to zero. Uh oh, now what? I'm not eating. I'm eating five things. I'm eating zero things. No, but no, I'm just kidding. I hope no one's eating zero, zero things, but you know, it gets close to it. We've had patients who are like, I'm eating five things and I can only eat five things. Otherwise I feel terrible. And it's, it's gets scary. So I think a lot of the focus is on that elimination, but part again, we want to refocus on that adding right reverse eliminating let's mm -hmm. add back in the right order in the right way and really get you feeling good and let's that, figure out why why aren't you tolerating fats okay let's let's see right. is something going on with your gallbladder let's yep. request that your care team look into that um you know why aren't you tolerating some of these legumes right. why aren't you tolerating fermented foods is it still a little snag with histamine and like you were saying we we'd like to combine things so maybe we'll recommend 
certain supplements that might be helpful in instances like those. Maybe we identify slight nutrient deficiencies, um, intestinal barrier dysfunction. And so we'll try to really address these things and help people overcome them. So that way they're not caught in this vicious cycle and this constant loop. And, and to touch on, cause I know there's a lot of on food combining, like when you're talking about like Ayurveda and things like that, we like to clarify really, you're talking about synergistic effects of food. Mm-hmm. And that is why we are whole food plant-based. So it's really when you are choosing whole foods, you are really getting a synergistic effect of food. Really? I mean, macros like, okay, what am I getting on my protein? And we do have patients like this. Like I need 13 or I need 33.5% of protein and 24.6% of carbs. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you could do that if you, if that brings you joy for the most part, it does not <laughs> like, that's how I'd get more gray hair. I'd be like, Oh my gosh. Like I'd be overwhelmed and like, uh, it brings stress. Right. So if it brings you joy, do it. If not, if you're, you know, like most, I would say 90 plus percent of people who don't want to do that, that's fine. You can stick with whole foods because in pretty much almost every whole food, you are going to get protein, fat, carbohydrates, right? Just in different ratios. And with that, our digestion has evolved to accompany that, right? So you're never really just eating carbohydrates or I'm just eating protein and I'm just eating fat. And I gotta, I gotta really put all this effort into eating it the right way. If you're eating whole foods, you're eating a mix of all of that. And our GI from the mouth to the anus has evolved to accompany a mixture of all protein, fat, and carbohydrates, right? So overall though, we know what we're learning is when you're combining these whole foods, you know, like turmeric and and black pepper is one that's really well known and like tomatoes with like bell peppers and, and spinach or something like that, right? So the vitamin C and the iron are all working together. There are these synergistic effects that happen, which is great. And so you can, you can really develop really cool recipes around that and make the food enhanced. Like when you're cooking, you know, we do love raw food. We also love cooked food. There's benefits to both, right? So we really just try to educate on these synergistic effects um, and not so much make it stressful, like, nope. Uh, and I don't, I don't even know. I mean, there's really no study that's been done on this in terms of like, you have to eat your fruit before your fat. And you can't combine the fat and the fruit and the, there's really no evidence to speak of that. And that's really not at all. If you studied anatomy and physiology, that's not how our, our body works at all. Right. There's no like train and it slowly is digesting each one. And it has to be in a specific order. There's no evidence to that whatsoever. So that's where, you know, there are some things from Eastern that are great. There are some things that's like, okay, it needs a little bit more context and we need to kind of dive a little deeper. And so we do that. And that's why I said, we try, try to pull from the good as much as possible. And keep an open mind. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think this has been such a comprehensive look at nutrition and the whole person that it's, it's more than just the food and measuring your macros and making sure you get the, the best foods all the time, but more of the diversity of the experience and that there is a little bit of trial and error involved mm-hmm. because not everybody is the same and what works for one person might not work for the other. So right. I just wanted to take the opportunity to ask you as well, because it's so fun having a married couple on here. Can you talk a little bit about just your relationship? Like what what is it like? Were you guys vegan when you met or did one change before the other? And I know this is a lot of questions at once, but essentially (laughs) there's anyone who's watching this, who might be considering going plant-based, but their partner doesn't want to, or something like that. Can you speak a little bit to, to your experience, what you've learned from that and making the relationship work while also incorporating holistic nutrition? Yeah. I love this question because <laughs> yeah. it is very much a part of our journey, but when we met, neither of us were plant-based. Um, in mm-hmm. fact, we were, James was very much probably the opposite. James, when I yeah. met him, had no neck. He was that gym bro who <laughs> ate know. tons of protein and he was all about his protein powder and his chicken, broccoli and rice. It's and that's called, all it's ate. called bro teen. No, yeah. I'm I wasn't a bro, but uh, yeah, I was that like gym. I was a total gym rat, like six, mm-hmm. maybe seven days a week in the gym, mm-hmm. just tons of protein from I don't care where um and yeah I was that guy for Mm -hmm. sure and Dahlia was the kind of more outgoing 
social butterfly, like eating yeah, whatever. Yeah, going out to eat a lot. Going and, out to eat. You know, we met in college when we were studying nutrition and we were very novice. We were very early on into our education. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think change came about when we just started becoming more conscious. I remember for a class for uh, food politics and ethics, I read Michael Pollan's um, In Defense of Food. And that's a very interesting, insightful book uh, shortly before that Food Inc. had come out. And so we had watched that. It was interesting to us, you know, Mm -hmm. James being very environmentally drawn and, you know, very much involved with the environment nature. Um, I was reading that book and I was discussing it with him and saying like, this is so interesting. And so from there, we just started learning more and more. Um, You know, James started reading the China study and kind of brought it to me too, to say, okay, let's educate ourselves in this. We started watching documentaries, Forks Over Knives came out shortly after that. And we started going to conferences. And I remember we went to a talk with Dr. Gregor and like Chef AJ was there. Absorbing yeah. everything. And yeah. we were learning little by little. And as we were learning, we were saying we were transitioning more into becoming plant-based. So it probably took nearly two years for us to say, neither of us ate pork when we met. That was a non-issue. Mm. We didn't really eat beef. So we were like, okay, let's stop beef. Um, okay. Let's not eat chicken. We were pescatarian for quite some time. And then we we're like, okay, maybe we'll drop off some of the fish. Um, and then from there, you know, we're kind of like lacto ovo vegetarians dropped off, uh, um, eggs, I think. And then, yeah. uh, you know, James tried to hold on to his cheese for a little while. That was the last thing to go for me being, <laughs> I'm Hispanic. I grew up eating cheese and string cheese and all this cheese. It was crazy, but yeah, now I couldn't even imagine eating that. I'm like, I have no desire for it. So we're going on almost, it'll be 11 years in January yeah, of plant-based. fully hundred percent plant-based vegan, you know, whatever you want to call it, but just no animal products, whatever, uh, whatsoever. And in that time we had a pregnancy, right? Our daughter is six years old. So in the, in that almost 11 years of being vegan, we have a six-year-old daughter who Dahlia went through a fully vegan plant-based pregnancy, right? Uh, our daughter is fully vegan, 100% plant-based. So it's, it's really cool to see that. Um, but go ahead. I, I interrupted you. <laughs> no, I think, okay. yeah. So it was really, I think successfully kind of being plant-based together. And, and we do even have dietitian colleagues who say my partner eats terribly, or my partner eats <laughs> very unhealthy processed yeah. food. Um, I think just really seeking to understand each other's values and each other's goals in life and really educate each other and educate together. I think that for us has been what has helped us remain this way and find success in it and really understand like, okay, Although some might claim if you eat, you know, a really diverse whole food plant-based diet, you don't need to take any supplements, just B12. That wasn't the case for us. I I remember along my journey feeling, especially after having my daughter feeling really depleted and feeling like, no, I don't think this is working for me. So really understanding like you should be supplementing at minimum with vitamin D if you need it. Um, Omega-3, those who are on a plant-based diet should be taking their omega-3s, their B vitamins. And then from there, really understanding what works for you. And, and it's given that context of like so much of our food is fortified. Why not? You know, we're already doing that. And and especially even if you're if, not eating the processed foods that are fortified right. for you. Right. So as you move to a whole food diet, it's like you are, you're in charge of that fortification. Mm-hmm. You can get an even higher quality third-party tested supplement. That's amazing. And there's no stigma to that, right? Because mm-hmm. you're, if you were eating foods, you're, you're fortified. So oh, one that we really like is complement. Um, which is great because even the name, it's like, that's what it is. You have a foundation of healthy whole foods and then you're complementing with some supplements just like you would, I would say it's a lesser quality though, fortified milks and other, other things like that. And even going back to some omnivores who are eating the animal, the animal's feed is fortified, right? Mm-hmm. So that goes down a whole nother rabbit hole, whole but, rabbit hole but that we could talk for another hour yes. on, but, um, but I- yeah, so overall, I mean, it's, and it's always, and the whole work dynamic, us working together, marriage, that's a whole nother five hours of conversation. But, you know, overall, we, we keep open minds, open hearts. Um, we, we're always growing. We're always trying to be better than we were yesterday, even, or even the last hour, you know, we're always changing and evolving. And so trying to just do the best we can. And I think that's the mindset we have for sure. Um, yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. So first of all, happy early 11th vegan anniversary to you <laughs> and whenever your Thank actual you. anniversary is. And also amazing that you have a six-year-old fully vegan child, like lucky for her, right? Yeah. <laughs> raised and not have to make all these t- difficult decisions as an adult later on, you know, maybe she can make her own choices when she's a little bit older, but having that baseline of it's going to be a little less difficult to have to give up things that you weren't raised with. So that's amazing. Wow. And I like what you're talking about with having the shared values, or at least asking your partner, prompting your partner or your family or whoever it is that you live with what their values are and realizing that people may have different values. So, you know, you talked a little bit about the environmental nutrition, so they might care more about the environment than the health aspect, or they might care more about the health aspect and the animals or anything in between. So having those discussions, having them with an open mind and doing it with love. And you guys also said that you transitioned slowly over like two years or so. So Mm -hmm. not rushing them, you know, we might want to, when we learn that information, we might want to just have it change immediately. Like this is right. We need to do this now, but having that patience, having that respect, having that conversation about the values and going into it with an open mind and with an open heart. So I want to thank you both for joining us. We like to end our sessions with this kind of fast fire round of five questions. So whenever you're ready. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> <I'm excited. laughs> All right. What's your favorite animal? Ooh, I think uh, dolphins are really cool. Super fascinating. Mm-hmm. That is not, I'm more the animal guy. I'm watching you animal shows. The with... animal lover. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know. I guess I'm biased. I just, I love our dog. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess dogs. <laughs> you could only eat one thing for the rest of your life what would it be that's easy i mean well if it has to be technically beans and rice like if i had beans and rice i'm good but if i had to be one thing i guess beans because i I love beans i love me a good tofu scramble burrito with veggies in it so i i I would be happy with that yeah (laughs) (laughs) what's your favorite vegan film or documentary Oh man. Yeah. I mean, Game Changers was great. I think Forks Over Knives is a classic. I mean, that it's, yeah, they did such a great job uh, with that and it really touches on so many aspects and so many, it still holds up till today and it's crazy how long it's been since it first came out. I don't Yeah. I think Forks Over Knives is great. I, I am also, also partial to Forks Over Knives. And even though it's not like a overtly vegan documentary, Food yeah. Inc, I think has been very insightful and just so people mm-hmm. understand the food system and why animal-based foods can kind of harbor more risk. And so I really like Food Inc. It's a classic for me. <laughs> this question, I'm going to revise it a little bit because it's who would you bring with you if you're stranded on a desert island? But I think we all know the answer to that. And if there's not the answer that we expect, then we don't want to hear that anyway. So let's change that one. <laughs> if you could bring one object with you to a desert island, what would that be? Oh, I think the, the Boy Scout, like logical person in me would, would be like a, a water filter, <laughs> like a, a Berkey. So we have water. Hmm. I think for me, it would be, it would be my phone so I can look things <laughs> up and really learn how to adapt in that environment. Yep. Like, I love that those uh, logical questions, right? She she can just call somebody and get rest. Yeah. He's going to be there alone with his water filter. Enjoy I'm your actually, water. Actually, I, I like, I would look forward to it. I'm like, ooh, a desert <laughs> island. Like, that'd be, that'd be great. Deserted island. Let's do it. As long as we got some water, we'll find some food, some coconuts <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally. Ah, so this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for being part of this summit and uh, just being yourselves here with us. And I'm sure that many people will want to keep in touch with you. So how can they find you? Yes, you can go to marriedtohealth.com. Uh, there you'll find we actually have a holiday ebook. We'll have mm-hmm. some other great stuff for you there. So you can sign up for our newsletter, yes. check out all of our services. Again, we see clients all over the world. So it can be done virtually through a video visit. Um, we're all over platforms, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Facebook, you name it, all, all the At platforms. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we have some exciting complimentary ebooks. We have other informative ebooks. So lots of things to help you and your fam just eat and tolerate more plant foods. That's our goal. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And lots of vegan love to you, James and Dahlia. Nice. Happy thank holidays. You. Thank you. Happy Likewise. holidays. Thank you for having us. <laughs>